Welcome back to The Graham Stephan Show. And unfortunately, the reality of today is that everything is getting more expensive. I, I think it's getting to a certain point where a lot of people are thinking, why even bother? The harder I work, it's not like I'm really making any difference towards buying a house in my area. Everything is so expensive. I may as well just dig myself deeper into debt. And I think more and more uh, younger people are starting to think, you know what, maybe I should just give up. And that's uh, why I want to talk about this video here. It's from Ramit Sadie. He posted this titled, Gen Z is giving up on their financial future. And I want to comment on it because number one, he has a fantastic channel that I'll link to down below in the description. But number two, I think he makes a lot of great points in here that I want to share with you guys. So with that said, hit the like button, subscribe. His information will be down below in the description. And now let's begin. A recent study found that 73% of young Americans want to enjoy their money now instead of saving money for the future. And that stat honestly makes me nervous. Why is this? Why are so many Gen Z and young people giving up on their financial future? So I want to stop there and just say that one of the reasons why people give up on something is because they don't see the point. They don't see the payoff. And for a lot of people, it's like, well, I may as well just live it up now because saving $1 a day for the next 30 years is not going to do anything. It's going to be a drop in the bucket compared to what I need. And if I have a chance to enjoy my money now or just never enjoy it in the future because I'll never have enough, I may as well just enjoy it now. And I think for a lot of people, that mentality is very true. It's like, what's the point? I'm already so deep in this hole. What's digging a little further going to actually do? It's so small. But you know what? Unfortunately, I do think it's the small little actions every day consistently that do end up making a significant positive difference long term. That if you can go and say, I'm going to delay this, I'm going to save the money, I'm, I'm going to not do this now for the sake of uh, you know potentially having a better future, most of the time you'll have a better future. So it's a bit of short-term thinking on that one, but we'll continue. 40 years ago, a house would cost roughly 2.5 times your annual income. Today, the median house costs six times your annual income. That means about 40 years ago, a person making the median salary, which was about 30K, would buy a house costing $81,000. Yeah, but you know what? In defense of that, I'm gonna give 40 years ago a little more reality on this. Interest rates were significantly higher. There was a point in the in the 1970s or early 1980s where interest rates were as high as like 18%. So, you know, yeah, it's still expensive today, but it, it's not quite fair to say, well, income was this and housing cost was this, because you have to factor in also interest rates, the cost of financing money. And back then, interest rates are way higher. Like, like having a 3% mortgage fixed for 30 years was just incomprehensible. People were paying 15% back then. So yeah, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but uh, you know, it's not exactly just two and a half times annual income. If you cut back on buying three Granny Smith apples a week, you'll be able to save money for a house. No, that's not how it works. What this means is that housing is historically unaffordable. You cutting back on matcha is not gonna change anything about being able to afford a house. Yeah, but you know what? It's like, uh, it's like saying, if you're trying to lose weight, tracking calories is not going to do anything to lose your weight. You actually have to go and, you know, not eat those extra calories. Yeah, but tracking and just being aware of it, starting somewhere, it's those habits that lead to greater things. That's why I truly believe it's like, hey, if you stop buying the Starbucks every day, that habit is going to bleed into other things because all of a sudden now you're on a streak and not buying coffee. Maybe you don't buy that extra outfit. Maybe you don't buy those extra tickets. Maybe you start seeing progress in your savings account. And once you start seeing that, you get positive reinforcement that, wow, I'm actually making a difference. So it's like all these little things. It could be like death by a thousand cuts. It's not one cut that's going to do it, but it's doing that a thousand times across a whole bunch of different stuff that will add up over time. Even to this day, I, I don't buy coffee ever, ever, unless I got a gift card or someone else is like, hey, my treat. And I'm like, really? You want to do this? I got coffee. Yeah, my treat. All right, then I'm going to get the coffee. But I mean, this still goes to show you uh, eight years later after talking about this, I still drink coffee from home all the time. And listen, I, I get it. It's, it's like $4 to go, but you know what? I, I just saved $4. I, I just made, I made $4 by not doing, uh, you know, going and buying a Starbucks. The other thing we're worried about, inflation. Let's take a look. I wanna show you three areas of our economy 
that have actually undergone rapid and sustained inflation. First, the cost of a college education has soared. Yeah, part of that college tuition, by the way, is because the government subsidizes it. They're just like, oh, let's give everybody college loans. And then they get shocked. The colleges raise their prices. Oh, who would have thought when you backstop loans that in response to that, prices go up. So, you know, it's government getting involved in college loans. There you go. Thank them for that. Price of a new car has wildly outpaced inflation over the last decade. Even rent prices are growing faster than income, which is creating the biggest divide in decades. Housing shortage. That's really all it is. Housing shortage. And uh, people want to live in very specific cities. I, I bet if you if you look throughout the United States, most people, probably 80% of the population is going to be in like, you know, the top 15 largest cities, give or take. So it's just supply and demand at that point. The mass media, which tells you that the economy is always horrible. Hmm, I wonder why. It turns out that a lot of people genuinely believe we are living in the worst economy in American history. That's insane to think that though, because, uh, you know, I think it's easy to look back at other times. Like, uh, you know, Macy and I were watching this movie from like the 1950s, and I was like, oh man, it looks so amazing to be able to grow up in a time like that. And you know what, I just think it's different, because I bet a lot of people in the 1950s would look at today and be like, look at all the technological advancements and the opportunities that you have now. All of a sudden, you can make a full-time living, you know, talking to a camera and posting YouTube videos, and you have all of these, you know, luxuries that we never would have at that time. Like, just being able to go and watch a Netflix, or watch a Netflix, go on the internet and text people and have all these social connections. People would look at that and envy that. So, I don't know. Plus, part of me wonders, did the people in the 1950s believe that they were born in a bad time? Like, maybe the people in the 1920s had it better. Maybe the people in the 1920s, look at the people in the 1800s. Like, oh, look at how much better things were back then. I don't know. I think we could always look back at different times and imagine that being a lot better. But then I'd look at today and think, how are we better today that wasn't possible back then? I think it goes both ways. Today we are making more money than our parents did. A lot more. And next, while everybody's complaining about inflation, wages have actually been growing. In fact, growing faster than inflation since February 2023. Yeah, only because inflation just like went so high and everyone's like, oh, no, inflation's good. But I knew that's gonna come back down at some point and then things are gonna level off. And yeah, prices are still high, but you know, eventually wages are gonna keep up and you know, I think that was a weird short-term blip where inflation went up 10% and everyone's like, well, my income also has to go up 10%. But then if inflation goes down, no one's going to say, well, I'm, I'm going to take less now because inflation's less. Like once you raise those wages, they're, they're risen. They're not going back down. They're only going back down if our economy goes to the absolute gutter. This reminds me of all these people who complain about the price of eggs, the price of lumber. Oh my God, I'm losing my mind. Gas is so expensive. Lumber, how are we gonna build a house? Lumber. Where'd you go when lumber came right back down to where it was? Nobody ever talks about when things get better. We are simply addicted to talking about when things go bad. Yeah, but that's human nature. Human nature is to look out for the troubles and the issues so you stay alive. So it's a, it's, an, it's a mechanism in the mind where it's more important for you not to get eaten by the tiger than it is to make sure you have an extra good meal that night. So you're gonna be more vigilant about like, where's the tiger than you are about, oh, let's get that, uh, you know, that, that animal over there and bring him back. So that's why I, I think humans are more attuned to getting away from something that's uncomfortable than they are from uh, moving to something that's maybe better for them. So that's why, and I think sometimes it's important to acknowledge that fear and it's there, it's not going away anytime soon, but at least you could diffuse it and say, hey, the stock market has these issues. But when you look back historically, this is what happens. And here's how you could prepare for it. So that's always been my kind of go-to or like, I don't wanna say a tactic, but it's always acknowledging that there are things to be concerned about but then realize that there are plenty of things that you could do to solve that and make it better and let it work in your favor. And then there's just simple numbers we can look at. Right now, more people are investing in the stock market than ever before. 
And that's important because the stock market is where real wealth is created. And you can start investing today. You can invest the same way that multimillionaires do. Exactly. And by the way, guys, if you are interested in this, I partnered with Acorns just for the month of April where they're giving you a $20 bonus when you sign up at acorns.com slash gram or you use the link down below in the description. Now, what I really like about them is that they have this roundup feature where they'll round up the purchases uh, to the nearest dollar and then all of a sudden they'll invest the difference in your behalf. So let's just say you link your credit or debit card with them. Uh, you spend $2.50 on French fries. That extra little 50 cents there, they'll round it up and then invest that difference uh, for you. So they make it really easy to do. And for the month of April, like I said, $20 as a bonus. Go to acorns.com slash gram or use the link down below in the description to get started. It's a fantastic offer. It's 20 minutes for less time than it takes you to watch this video. So if, if you want $20 in like three minutes, five minutes, whatever, however long it takes you, the link is down below. Enjoy, and it's going away in like a few weeks. So if you don't do it now, you might miss out on it. So there you go. And it's a good way to start investing. You need to be mastering the fundamentals when it comes to your money. You're not going to wait for a macroeconomic shift. No, you're going to control what you can control. That means every single month, I recommend you invest at least 10% of your money and it's happening automatically. Yeah, see, this is why it's so important. Just set a schedule and stick with it no matter what. If the market's up at all-time highs, you stick with it. If the market drops 30%, you stick with it. If you're concerned, uh, you know, something's gonna happen, you stick with it. You stick with it no matter what long-term. 10%, I'd, I'd argue, good starting point. If you could bump it up to 15 to 20, that's where I think it tends to, you know, it should really be around there if you're looking to retire in like 30, 35 years, 40 years, whatever. 15, 20% is where I tend to think it should be. But start at 10. Just start at 10, and then the more you could save, the better. The more you could invest, the better. If you save 30%, invest 30%, fantastic. But yeah, start with 10 and then improve from that. You're saving five to 10% towards a three month emergency fund. Next, your fixed costs are below 50 to 60%. And the last one, my favorite one of all, you are spending the rest of your money guilt-free. Okay, okay, so here's the part I disagree with. I don't like how the guilt-free 20 to 35% is higher than the investments. I would love that to be flipped. Invest 20 to 35% of your income and then spend guilt-free 10% of it. I just think you flip those, and this would make a lot more sense to me. The fixed cost, 50 to 60%, that's fine. Savings, 5 to 10%, you know, if that's in conjunction with investments, that's good too. The guilt-free spending, 20 to 35, I would bring that down. Invest more, guilt-free spend less. I spend extravagantly on the things I love, which included a multi-day wedding and nice clothes. I know you frugal freaks online think weddings are a complete waste of money and you prefer to wear a stretched out Cisco t-shirt from 2004. That's your prerogative. If that's your rich life, <laughs> such as it is, fantastic. You know what? I don't get why that's so hard for people to acknowledge. It's just like, hey, I disagree with this person on this one point because I believe this or because I was told differently or because I did my own research. There's no reason to get upset with that. But like people, I think, take too many things to heart or too many things as gospel. If one person says it, they're like, oh, that must be it. Not do any research themselves. I think it's so important that like anything you hear, verify it for yourself. Don't just take someone's word for it. If you see an article, don't just believe whatever the article says. Do actual research yourself. I would challenge you just for the next week, for the next day, if you see a headline or you see something, investigate it and find out if that's actually true. And I bet like more than half of the stuff you see is not telling the full story. It might only be true in like this one context, but when you look at the bigger picture, it's like, yeah, well, that's not always the case. There's so much nuance to life that you, you gotta come at everything with just a bit of skepticism and then come in with your own research, your own opinion. For example, you might love spending money having an amazing sushi dinner once a week, or you might want a relaxing massage once a month because it helps you with your health. That's great too. Yeah, I'm so cheap. Uh, and I don't mean cheap as like a, uh, you know, a negative way, but I'm saying like my interests are so inexpensive. Besides the reef aquarium, that's the only thing that like, you know, yeah, it could get a little pricey. And by pricey, I mean, maybe you're spending a few hundred bucks on like a fish. Like that's, that's my extravagance. But for the most part, like me having a great time, 30 bucks all you could eat sushi. Go with some friends, that's the best time in the world. Going to the gym, totally free. Best time in the world. Uh, you know, putting on a good show, best time in the world. It's, it's like all those things don't cost a lot of money to do. Yes, we need more affordable housing. 
Yes, we need education and childcare to become more affordable. Yes, that's why I vote and that's why you should too. But we also need to take responsibility for our own rich lives. Yes, I completely agree with that. The thing is just not complaining because uh, complaining gets nowhere. What it will get you though is sympathy online. You go and complain online, you're gonna get a whole bunch of people saying, yeah, you know, it's so tough too. And, and just basically everyone just like patting each other on the back and like who has it worse. It, it's for nothing, you know? At the end of the internet points, who needs internet points? You know, complaining is just a lot of wasted energy. I think it's, do you take matters into your own hands? Do you, do you act on what you can control? And do you try to do something for yourself to have a better future? If the answer is yes to that, I think you're, you're, you're set. And, and as always, you want to save money, cut back on things you don't need, the usual stuff. But let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section. As always, feel free to hit the like button, subscribe, and don't forget that you could get that $20 down below in the descriptions when you sign up at acorns.com slash gram. Again, it's going away in a few weeks, so if you don't do it now, you might miss out. It's 20 bucks. In the time it took you to watch this video, you could have made $20. So enjoy. Let me know. Until next time.